Good evening, everyone. How is everyone today? Good. I heard a few goods out there. I'm Jeff Gingrich, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to this evening to the lecture of Father Columbus Stewart of the Order of St. Benedict. We begin with an invocation, which will be offered by Dr. Christian Crocus, Professor in the Theology and Religious Studies Department. Dr. Crocus. In light of our guest, uh, Father Columba's life and work, which model the possibility and the reality of encounter, dialogue, and friendship among women and men from various languages, cultures, churches, religious traditions, and even centuries, I want to offer as our invocation the prayer that Pope Francis includes at the end of Fratelli Tutti, his recent encyclical on fraternity or sorority and social friendship. So for those whose tradition it is, let us begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord of our human family, you created all human beings equal in dignity. Pour forth into our hearts a fraternal spirit and inspire in us a dream of renewed encounter, dialogue, justice, and peace. Move us to create healthier societies and a more dignified world a world without hunger, poverty, violence, and war. May our hearts be open to all the peoples and nations of the earth. May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you have sown in each of us, and thus forge bonds of unity, common projects, and shared dreams. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Crocus. Today is a very special day, not only because we get to hear from a renowned scholar as Father Columba, but even more so because we have the honor of bestowing our highest honorary degree on Father Columba. I now ask Dr. Gretchen Van Dyke, Associate Professor in the Political Science Department, Reverend Joseph G. Marina of the Society of Jesus, our president, and Father Columba, to please join me in the middle of the stage for the reading of the citation for Father Columba as a candidate for the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, followed by the President's formal conferral of the citation. <clears throat> a Benedictine monk like no other, Father Columba Stewart has traveled to some of the world's most dangerous places and used state-of-the-art digital technology to preserve early Christian and Islamic manuscripts threatened by destruction from weather, theft, unrest, and war. The executive director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library at St. John's University for nearly 20 years, Father Stewart has worked closely with international church leaders, governments, and cultural organizations to preserve centuries-old sacred handwritten manuscripts in Europe Africa, the Middle East, and India, including initiatives focused on the digitization of Islamic manuscripts. Through his efforts, the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library launched an online reading room to provide access to the library's growing digitized collection, which is already the world's largest digital collection of ancient manuscripts. As a scholar, Father Stewart has published extensively on ancient Christianity and Benedictine and Eastern Christian monasticism, including studies of early monastic understandings of contemplative prayer and biblical, biblical interpretation. His books include Working the Earth of the Heart, the Mizalian Controversy in History, Te Text, and Language of 431, and Prayer and Community, the Benedictine Tradition. 
In recognition of his work, Father Stewart has received numerous grants, awards, and fellowships, including a residency at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and a Guggenheim Fellowship Award. In 2019, he was selected to present the National Endowment for the Humanities Jefferson Lecture, which is the highest honor the federal government bestows for distinguished intellectual achievement in the humanities. His work has also, ca also caught attention of 60 Minutes, the BBC, Harvard Magazine, and The Atlantic. A magna cum laude graduate of Harvard University, Father Stewart also holds a master's in religious studies from Yale University and a doctorate in theology from Oxford University. Before the formal words that I will use for the conferral of the degree, let me add my own words of welcome and congratulations to Father Columba. Uh, for a Benedictine to walk onto a Jesuit campus is an act of great courage in and of itself. But in addition to those, so many other brave acts all done in the name of the faith and of scholarship. And so, through efforts led by Father Stewart, the precious lessons contained in early religious texts are now preserved and can be widely shared for generations to come. Therefore, we, the president and trustees of the University of Scranton, in solemn convocation assembled and in accord with our chartered authority, declare Reverend Columba Stewart, OSB, Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa, that he may enjoy all the rights and privileges of this, our highest honor. We have issued these letters patent under our hand and the corporate seal of the university on this 21st day of October in the year of our Lord, 2021. Father Marina, Dr. Gingrich, faculty, staff, administrators, students, and friends of this Jesuit university. I'm delighted and honored that you've joined us this evening to celebrate a special friend to all of us who appreciate and love the humanities and the liberal arts, Father Columbus Stewart. Because you've now, you're now aware of his incredible bio, I shall introduce Father Columba through a few stories about the friend I made while on a year-long sabbatical in 2018-2019, being reflective in the best sense of Ignatian spirituality. For that year, Columba and I were fellow residential scholars at the Collegeville Institute for Ecumenical and Cultural Research, a mere quarter mile down the road from his home at St. John's Abbey and his directorship of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota about 85 miles northwest of the Twin Cities, and about 1,200 or so miles north-northwest of Scranton. I must admit, I was clueless about Columba Andrew Stewart, OSB, when I arrived at the Institute on September 5, 2018. My crazy and hectic summer had prevented my researching the other residential scholars. Although I had quickly looked at the Institute's website and realized a Benedictine monk was part of the group, for my entire eight month stay, no less. I already knew two other scholars well, Mark Schwain and his wife, Dorothy Bass, leaders in the Lilly Fellows Program in Humanities and the Arts. It was Mark who said to me that very first day, quote, well, the real scholar, star among us, is Columbus Stewart, but we haven't met him yet, end quote. Great, my exhausted mind thought. Well, I finally did meet Columba at orientation the next day, and again the following Tuesday, our first official seminar day as scholars. 
That day, I received a genu genuinely warm and pleasant, hi, I'm Columbus Stewart, from him. I remember take, his taking notes as each of our colleagues introduced themselves professionally and personally, speaking precisely and concisely, even-toned, yet in a good-natured and well-spoken manner. I remember thinking, OK, an early Christian medieval historian type, working on the details of early Christian monasticism, could be interesting, seems nice, let's see. Well, we had another encounter about 10 days later, a social one at Mark and Dorothy's apartment. Columba arrived a little bit later than others, dressed in his casual Steve Jobs-inspired habit, graciously accepting a cocktail from our host. In that same nice, crisp, and inquisitive tone, he asked me, quote, so when did your brother join the Jesuits? Thus, we initially chatted not about me, but about my brother's life in the society, which runs relatively parallel to Columba's own time with the Benedictines. And we talked about his godmother's son, Raymond Fitzgerald, his Jesuit friend, who had been the young president of Jesuit High in New Orleans, who sadly had died of ALS just two years before. Needless to say, Columba's own ALS story struck a sensitive chord, as my own friend Scott Pilar's had relayed his ALS diagnosis to me on the Tuesday before I drove off to Collegeville. As Columbus and my encounters continued, I grew to appreciate this intelligent and always collegial contributor to our Tuesday seminar conversations, what one hopes from a Harvard-Yale-Oxford academic pedigree, to admire his deeply passionate vocation, preserving for all humanity, for all eternity, irreplaceable religious and cultural manuscripts and artifacts at the root of his endless world travels to some really rugged places and in the midst of incredibly dangerous situations. To respect and marvel at this teacher scholar, gifted in multiple languages who directs Himmel and maintains a high level research agenda, frequently speaking to academic groups around the country and the world and attending international meetings in places like the Vatican. Yet Columba never wears his accomplishments on his sleeve, nor advertises easily all he must juggle in any of, a, of this on a daily basis, no less. On a lighter side, I came to love Columba's capacity for engaged and engaging conversation, often with a quick and dry wit woven in. He's well-read and well-informed about myriad things, books, movies, music, you name it. He's a fan of both opera and jazz and follows current events and politics with an intense curiosity and interest, which I nat naturally appreciated. In that way, he's a walking advertisement for the liberal arts, and one thus understands why his AB from Harvard came with a Phi Beta Kappa T key too, our country's oldest and most prestigious honor society dedicated to the liberal arts. In time, we also talked about our parents and families, shared stories about our siblings, and especially our mothers. Women of the same generation, nearly the same age, and devout in their Catholic faith, similar in their late life health challenges, and which challenged their children as well. Here, especially, I encountered the Benedictine monk, pious but never self-righteous, faith-filled and deeply spiritual, kind, humble, gentle, and always prayerful. During our seminar break one Tuesday that October, Columb and I were chatting about our individual travels the previous week. I mentioned in the midst of everything else, my mother had suffered a mild heart attack, needless to say, a cause for concern. Later that evening, Columba emailed me, subject line, your, mo your mom, asking me for her name. Quote, I like to pray for people by name, he wrote, though I'm confident that Gretchen's mom works, end quote. A few months later, as I braved the cold in worst February ever recorded in Minnesota, and Columba was leading Himmel donors to sites in India and Nepal, I emailed him to confirm dates for an upcoming event he and I would lead on Benedict and Ignatius. At the end of the message, I mentioned my mother was really sick with flu, and I asked him to pray for her. He quickly replied, quote, your mom has been on my daily list since the fall. 
keep me posted, end quote. When one engages in the fundamental Ignatian practice of prayerful reflection, one realizes the various jigsaw puzzle pieces, large and small, comprising our grace-filled lives. The special places, events, moments, and of course people that gradually fit together to form our unique picture. I now know Columbus Stewart as part of my life's puzzle. And for that, I remain deeply grateful. And now all of us at the University of Scranton are realizing this magnif magnificent grace as part of the treasured fabric of our community. Please join me in officially welcoming this new Scranton Royal to our blessed puzzle, Father Columbus Stewart. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for the warm welcome, the gracious introduction. Uh, Gretchen just said that I don't wear my accomplishments on my sleeve, but I wonder if I can wear the hood on the plane. What do you think? <laughs> it might lead to some interesting conversations. Teasing about Benedictines and Jesuits aside, it is a great honor to be at this Jesuit institution. I have enormous respect for the tradition and particularly for the commitment of the Society of Jesus to the education of young people in various contexts, some affluent, some not so much, always in service to the communities in which they're located. Gretchen mentioned my godparent son, Raymond Fitzgerald. Uh, we were born about the same time. Our parents went through pregnancy together and then lo and behold, 20 something years later, we both entered religious life. So this has been woven into my story, and it's a wonderful experience as a member of an old religious order to be present in a place that we still think of as founded by a new religious order, even though for many of you it may seem like they've been around for an awfully long time. So my task this evening is to introduce you a little bit to the work that was described in the citation and in the introduction. Uh, and this is the story of the work of my monastery, which it has been my privilege to continue over the last 18 years as the executive director. So to do that, I, I need to begin first by telling you a little bit about what a manuscript is. Now, this may seem like an obvious uh, point, but I think it's very important to understand why it's worth going to the time, trouble, and finding the financial resources for the work that I'm going to describe because of how much we depend on manuscripts for what we think we know about the past. So with that, let's look at one. And by coincidence, I'm showing you the oldest copy of the Rule of St. Benedict. So this is a manuscript which is now in Oxford. It probably came from northern France. It was taken to the British Isles during a period when Benedictine monasticism was becoming quite established in the British Isles. And that was a key part of what made the rule of Benedict the monastic norm throughout Europe. Because until the 8th and 9th century, monasteries, well, there was many rules as there were monasteries. The rule of Benedict was only one of them. But over time, it gained ground for its moderation, its wisdom, its, uh, shall we say, constitutional principles for establishing and sustaining a community. I've had the privilege of actually holding this manuscript uh, during my time in Oxford. And I also learned through this manuscript in my study of the rule that manuscript, manuscripts can be a little bit deceptive. So I mentioned earlier that this is the oldest known copy of the rule of Benedict, and that is true. However, it is not the best copy of the text of the rule of St. Benedict. And this reminds us that part of the work of manuscript scholarship is finding as many manuscripts as you can find of a particular text, and then working closely with them to determine which one might most accurately reflect something close to the original source. So 
All modern editions of the Rule of Benedict are not made from this oldest manuscript. They're made from one that's uh, perhaps about 100 years uh, younger, which is now in the Great Library of St. Gallen in Switzerland. So a single manuscript is not enough. But each manuscript, in its own way, comments on the text it contains, because they are never identical. When we were children, we used to play a game we called the telephone game. Maybe you have versions of this, where you sit in a big circle, and somebody whispers something into the ear of the person next to them, and it keeps going around the circle. And then the last person has to say what they heard, which never is exactly the same as what happened at the beginning. Now, with manuscripts, that happens. And sometimes it's just a mistake. A careless scribe missed a line, uh, misspelled a word. But other times, the difference in the text is telling us something about the way that particular piece of work was read and used in a particular place, adapted, modified, a change that's expressed in the text itself. So this is why we go around collecting as many of these things as we can. Part of what we've been doing at Himmel in terms of our work with Christian manuscripts, and I'll say more about the Islamic side a little bit later, is following what you might call these pathways of manuscript and textual transmission. You can see it all begins in the Middle East, in the Holy Land. Uh, of course, the life of Jesus, his earliest followers. But it quickly spreads in various languages throughout the world as it was known at that time and as it was known in the early late antique period. And thus you see that wonderful arc going all the way to India where there were certainly Christians at least in the second century, if not earlier, because there were Roman trading posts on that southwest coast of India. So one way to think of what we do is we follow this, these pathways to try to see uh, what's left of manuscripts and textual transmission in each of these places and languages. And then once we get as much of it as we can, we can start comparing. How does the text change when it gets translated? Uh, are there adaptations made uh, from one particular tradition of interpretation to another? So I spent a lot of time trying to recreate this map in my own journeys. Now, in doing this, I'm echoing uh, the tradition of great travelers in the past. And we sometimes think that the ability to traverse a great distance is a modern thing, because now we have steam-powered boats, and then we had airplanes and so on. But this map reminds us that there were great medieval travelers. And this shows you the travels of Marco Polo in red. You've probably heard of him, if nothing else from the stupid game we used to play in swimming pools as kids. But you may not be equally aware of Benjamin of Tudela, who was a Jewish medieval traveler and scholar, or Ibn Battuta, the great uh, Arabic chronicler of what he found on his travels. And what we need to remember is that everywhere these people went, they had their own manuscripts with them. So sacred texts, other texts of particular interest to them. And they also gathered texts, because nobody who would make journeys like this in that period would come home empty-handed. And because these are people who had a certain interest in culture and literature, particularly Benjamin and even Batuta, uh, you can guess that they had manuscripts in the sort of saddlebags of their donkey or horses when they came back. So in a way, this illustrates for us a kind of intellectual network. And if you imagine manuscripts in each of those places and many other places that these travelers never went to, you begin to understand that we can think of manuscripts throughout time, passing from one place to another, one language to another, as being the original Internet of Things. So this is how people were connected, intellectually and religiously. So I'll show a, a sort of last introductory example about manuscripts with a text that is of particular interest to me. OK, so you see the, the little uh, sort of blown up part of the text. It's a Syriac um, writing of the name of Origen. Now, Origen was a third century Christian theologian of enormous importance. Arguably, I would argue, the single most important Christian theologian in the history of Christianity. I think more than Augustine myself, but I can argue with the Western medievalists. 
What's interesting about Origen is he became very controversial. A number of his works were uh, either no longer copied in the original language of Greek or disappeared, and they survive oftentimes only in translation, such as in Latin. The tradition of Syriac Christianity, which you'll hear more about in its homeland of Mesopotamia a little bit later, prized a lot of monastic writings that grew out of the theology of Origen. But by the time those writings were translated into Syriac in the course of the fourth and fifth century, Origen had become a kind of dirty word because his theology was thought to be controversial. And there are no texts of Origen that were ever translated into Syriac. So I went down one of those rabbit holes that we sometimes do of wondering, well, do they ever mention him? Do they use his name? Were they aware of who he was, even though he seems to be the great unmentionable? And I found one text which actually uses his name and quotes from his works, and it's in an entirely non-polemical manner. So this was a project which was looking at um, collections of texts, little blocks of text, used as an introduction to the Book of Psalms in the Greek tradition. Okay? So like introductions to the Psalms by great authors, and it was kind of a preface to the Book of Psalms. This whole collection got translated into Syriac, with interesting additions, subtractions, and served as a kind of uh, primer, if you will, at the beginning of the Book of Psalms in Syriac tradition as it had in Greek. So here's an example of a Syriac Psalter, the same manuscript that you just saw the name of origin written in. This is in the British Library, and it's one of the fantastic early Syriac manuscripts that the British, uh, shall we say, picked up in Egypt at various points in the colonial era. It's a translation of the Syriac Psalter, uh, which is very faithful to the Greek. Uh, it's really of little interest to me. I'm more interested in the preface. But as I've leafed through the manuscript, I found something in the margin, which was extraordinary. And just to blow it up for you, this is somebody who wrote in the original manuscript during the time it was in Egypt, in Latin, the verse uh, one of the verses of the Psalms in the Latin Vulgate translation. Now, how the heck did that happen? How was somebody who could not only read Latin but write it in an Egyptian monastery, fairly remote, around the 12th century, because that's the era of the handwriting you see there, not a professional scribe, interacting with a Syriac language monk to discuss a text they had in common? So I'm simply mentioning this to say that manuscripts do have these stories of previous contact. And it could be that this was a chaplain with one of the bands of crusaders who passed through Egypt, got interested in a particular monastery in their library, and probably with an interpreter, had a little heart to heart, and then they showed off each other's texts. So when you reconstruct the journey of that particular manuscript, it turns out it was not written in Egypt. It came from Mesopotamia. So there's Edessa, the birthplace of Syriac or Aramaic Christianity, written there in the 7th or 8th century, taken to Egypt by a, a bibliophile abbot of a monastery in Egypt composed of Syriac tradition monks, and then taken to London in the 19th century. And if you go to the British Library today, as I have done many times with this manuscript, they just hand it to you and let you work on it. What an extraordinary journey that single book had. And you can imagine all the journeys that we don't even know about because the manuscripts are no longer with us. And then one little curiosity before we um, take a bit of a turn to talk more about our project. We did some work in uh, both Aleppo and Istanbul, Aleppo, Syria, Istanbul, Turkey, with Armenian communities. And in the Aleppo, which has an historic Armenian community, suffered greatly, of course, during the recent civil war and troubles in Syria. There was a manuscript which had been written in Istanbul in the 16th century. But the fly leaves, you know, so the sort of extra stuff at the beginning of the end, was, as is typical for manuscripts, made up of recycled manuscript pages from old things that they were throwing out or had worn out. And this is how you protected the text you were really interested in, which was the new manuscript. So that's Latin. And when you look more closely, 
It's the very distinctive form of Latin writing known as Beneventan script. And it's a little piece cut out of what at one time was a, a very large and impressive Bible. How did Armenians in Istanbul in the 16th century come across fragments of such a valuable Latin manuscript and then recycle it? Well, before the, uh, the Turkish conquest of Constantinople, later Istanbul, there were significant communities of Italian traders in, in that city. And of course, they had their religious books in their churches. And this is one that got left behind when they got forced out at the time of the conquest. And then another example of what can happen with manuscripts, and this would be a manuscript tradition that disappeared. What you see before you is a painting from uh, a cave in Western China. And it depicts scribes of the Manichaean religion writing um, their uh, manuscripts around the 8th or 9th century. Now, I'd love to talk about the Manichaeans at great length because I'm doing a lot of work on them right now, but I'm not. I'm just going to say it's a really important religious movement that died out completely. And all of its writings by their founder, originally written in Syriac, were destroyed. This is all we have left of the original writings of their founder in the original language. Everything else is simply quotations of his works and other writings. So things come and go, they disappear, and then there are other threats. This is a Syriac manuscript which contains that little preface to the Psalms that I mentioned earlier. At one time, this was in uh, Baghdad, in Iraq, and it belonged to the Patriarchate of the Chaldean Catholic Church, which is the Iraqi Catholic Church. And I needed to look at this manuscript, but I couldn't find it. And it turned out there was a microfilm made by a Dutch project in the uh, late 1950s. And so here it is. It's a beautiful photograph as a composition. It's really hard to read this thing, but I did. Later, we digitized this collection. This manuscript, however, was not there. In the chaos of the Iraq wars, particularly the war of 2003 and following, the manuscript disappeared. One of the most precious witnesses to that particular tradition. And then there's trafficking. At the top, you see a manuscript that we microfilmed in the 1970s. This was one of our earliest non-European projects for Himmel. It's a very distinctive manuscript, as you can tell from the decoration. It's 15th century. It's quite a valuable collection of books that are not in our Bibles, but that the Ethiopians kept in their Bibles long after they fell out of use uh, among both Christians and Jews. That manuscript is now in a private collection in Oslo, as you can see from their website, where they advertise their ownership. And if you look down to the line that says provenance, so where did the manuscript come from? It's the name of a dealer. So the threats to the voices of the ancestors, what we know of historic wisdom, are many. So what do you do in the face of this? Well, you find a monk. And so we follow in the tradition of our founder, Father Oliver Kapsner, rather idealized in this, this kind of dreamy portrait. He was a stubborn, persistent German, like so many of the founders and the older members of my own monastery. And it was Father Oliver who, in the 1960s, saw the situation in Europe of the Cold War. So for some of you, this is a memory. For others of you, it's history. But we really thought there might be a World War III in Europe. And this would have been a nuclear war. And it would have destroyed uh, monuments, libraries, not to mention the horrific cost of human life. Father Oliver thought we should go over to Europe and microfilm manuscripts. Just in case something were to happen, we would at least have a microfilm copy of it. And so he started in Austria, which was one of the few places in Europe where monasteries kept their manuscripts because there was no Reformation, there was no French Revolution, and so these libraries of the great Austrian abbeys were left undisturbed. So he went over, he persuaded finally one abbot to let, him, let us do the work, and he began with his mobile microfilming studio in that fabulous VW bus that people used to use as campers and have surfboards hanging out of 
we had a microfilm camera in there. And there you see them at work, the stacks of medieval Latin manuscripts uh, at Krimsmünster, one of the great uh, Austrian abbeys, photographing the collection. Well, since then, we've really expanded our reach. Uh, I mentioned Ethiopia. Um, we still work in Europe. So uh, you can see it sort of skews a bit toward Eastern Europe with a continuing interest in Malta uh, because it's a very interesting crossroads place in the Mediterranean. And Italy, where a lot of odd collections ended up belonging to different traditions. Most of the work that I was involved in in my early, early part of my tenure as director was in the Middle East. We've worked in Gaza, Iraq, Jerusalem, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Yemen. In other words, really interesting places which have had a very checkered and painful history in recent years. In Africa and Egypt, Ethiopia, Libya, Mali. Mali, one of our biggest projects. I'll say more about that later. And then a new kind of growth area for us in South Asia, India, Nepal, Pakistan, working with Christian, Islamic, and more recently, Hindu manuscripts for the sake of preservation and access. So briefly, this is how we do what we do before we take you to some of these really interesting places. We are a library of libraries. We partner with other libraries to digitize, archive, and share their manuscripts. The manuscripts stay in their original location. The owners have copies of all the photos, and they can do whatever they want with them. They can publish them, they can sell them, whatever they want, as long as we can make them available to scholars. We tend to focus on regions where manuscripts are at risk, so the, the sort of things that I mentioned a few minutes ago, or they are inaccessible. You can't just show up and knock on the door and ask for a library card and read the manuscript. They just don't do that kind of thing. We provide the equipment for digitizing. We train and support local workers, so we pay them, or thanks to our donors, we pay them. So we inject a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of income into the local economy, uh, which in many of the places where we work is horrible. So this is an employment opportunity which would not otherwise exist. And then our promise to our partners is that we will safely archive and share the images online and provide tools for research so that their tradition can be highlighted, well described, and accessible online for free. And one of the things that we've learned, even in the 18 years I've been involved, is that we end up tracking what happens to collections. They move because of war. In some cases, they are destroyed. In other cases, they are missing. And this is all since 2003. So we've become a kind of repository of information about cultural heritage at risk. So I just want to show you a handful of places to give you a flavor of uh, the kind of thing we do and where we've done it. We worked in Syria quite a bit from 2005 to 2012. And the, our principal center for activity was Aleppo which is a fascinating cosmopolitan city. It was one of the starting points of the Silk Road passing through the Middle East, a, a city that had historically a very significant Jewish community, Christian community, and then, of course, later an important center for the Muslim community. In the course of my lifetime, I have seen that change completely. The Jewish community was forced to leave in the 1950s and early 1960s because of the Arab-Israeli tension leaving their, their ancient and beautiful synagogue buildings and managing to get their manuscripts out for the most part. But the city was bereft of that tradition. Since the 2011 and following conflict in Syria, that has been the story for many of the Christians who no longer feel welcome in their ancient home and who left, uh, taking their manuscripts, in other cases a remnant of people, staying back with the collections. This is the great architectural gem of Aleppo, the Umayyad Mosque, beautiful example of early Islamic architecture. And this is what happened to it during the war. So what's significant about this for our work is not just, yeah, we worked there, it was a place I loved, I spent a lot of time there. What's significant about it is nobody expected this to happen in Syria. It came out of nowhere, and everyone assumed that Syria was the most stable place in the Middle East because of its dictatorship. So this just shows you that authoritarianism can look strong, 
but it doesn't take much to topple it. And this is the sort of storm that swept through Syria. Now, of course, he's still there. Assad is still there. But certainly, his rule is diminished. And his preservation, self-preservation, was at the cost of tremendous destruction. On the left is the Greek Catholic Archbishop's residence and cathedral. That's where I used to stay. Uh, and I'm going to show you another example later of a place I used to stay that was severely damaged or destroyed. And on the right is the Armenian Cathedral, the place that had that manuscript I showed you a little while ago that was written in Istanbul, had the Latin pages as the fly leaves. This is what happened to their beautiful old church. And most poignantly, from a personal perspective and an ecclesiastical one, two of the bishops in Aleppo uh, were kidnapped in April of 2013. This is Mar Gregorios, who is the Syriac Orthodox Metropolitan, the man who gave us permission to digitize their manuscripts in Aleppo, which included manuscripts that had been taken out of Turkey in 1923 when their community was driven out of Turkey because of anti-Christian persecution. He and his Greek Orthodox counterpart, uh, Metropolitan Paul Yazigi, were both kidnapped and have not been heard from since. Part of the chaos of war. Early on in my tenure, which coincided with the 2003 invasion of Iraq, people kept saying, you need to do something in Iraq. But it, it took us a while to establish a way to do that. As you can imagine, uh, showing up as an American in post-2003 Iraq did not always guarantee a warm welcome. And particularly among the Christian community who had suffered greatly in the uh, dislocation and the aftermath of that war, as the country basically broke into sectarian enclaves of Sunni and Shia. Our particular interest was the northern part of Iraq, the so-called Nineveh Triangle. So when I say the word Nineveh, does that have any biblical connotation for people? The prophet blank. Prophet Jonah. OK, good. So the prophet Jonah went to Nineveh to preach repentance. Nineveh was an ancient city. Uh, before there were Jews there, then the Jewish community was there, then the Christians came. Ancient Nineveh is Mosul. And so if you follow anything about recent history of Iraq, you know that Mosul was one of the most contested um, and troubled locations with many historical monuments that were destroyed during the occupation by ISIS. This whole region of northern Iraq is uniquely rich in religious traditions. This is the area which was the home of the, the strongest ancient Iraqi Jewish community, which continued to speak Aramaic, the language of their ancestors. Also Christian villages, and then Yazidis, who are one of the religious communities that have suffered most uh, since the 2014 occupation of the region by the Islamic State. In 2009, I made my first journey to Iraq to meet this man, a Dominican friar, uh, an Iraqi native, but a member of the Dominican order, uh, Father Najib Mikhail, who had started a project in Mosul uh, the year before to start photographing manuscripts because he thought something might happen. Uh, 2003 had been bad. Mosul had become a very dangerous place. He was looking for a partner. We had a mutual friend, and so we started working with him. This photograph was taken in June of 2012, just before the rise of ISIS, and that is the plain of Nineveh. So that is the area where, where Jonah was preaching his message. Um, and that is a piece of territory that it has an incredibly complicated and long human history. In August 2014, two months after Mosul fell to these uh, jihadists who came from nowhere, as it seemed at the time, they invaded the rest of the Nineveh Triangle. And so Christian villages like Karakosh, the Yazidis at Mount Sinjar, had hours' notice to pack up everything they had and flee their ancient homeland. So the Christian communities in that part of Iraq uh, were probably, before they became Christian, they may have been Jewish or they may have been traditional religion, but they had been in the same place, whatever their religion, for centuries and centuries and centuries. So families fleeing with the sheep they could gather up, uh, mothers with their babies, walking 40 miles to the Iraqi August to the Kurdish city of Erbil to find safety. After ISIS occupied the region, they went to work 
destroying everything that did, meet, did not meet their very narrow understanding of what was appropriate for Islam. So they blew up the ancient Assyrian site of Nimrud. You can see the remains of those beautiful Assyrian carvings using dynamite and barrel bombs. The Christian shrine of Mar Benam, a very venerated shrine at a monastery, uh, blown up on video and broadcast through their social media channels. The monastery where that shrine was, was occupied and defaced. Uh, they ruined all the sculptures by removing all the animals, human figures, saints, and so on, and then put ISIS graffiti all over the place. They also destroyed secular culture. The University Library of Mosul, one of the best university libraries in the Middle East, a library like yours, designed to support education, help young people in their studies and prepare for their careers. ISIS burned the books. We destroyed the building in the campaign to liberate Mosul in 2000, late 2016, early 2017. This is what a library looks like when the books have been burned. So everywhere when I was there in May of 2017 with um, a team from CBS News 60 Minutes, there was ash everywhere. And that was their collection. Equally, the Dominicans with whom we worked, Father Najib and his, uh, his confrere, they had a priory in Karakosh, that Christian village that they all fled from. It was their refuge from Mosul at a time when Mosul was full of kidnapping of clergy. And they kidnapped clergy not because they hated Christianity, but because they could get a higher ransom for clergy. Uh, I don't know if that would be true in this country, but it was true in Iraq. So they left Mosul to go to Karkosh. This is the place I used to stay, the building that Father Najib designed and built. And the room up on the upper right hand is where I used to stay. Their own library, the working library of a religious community, um, Biblical commentaries, dictionaries, histories, that kind of thing, reduced again to ashes. And in the midst of all that, a completely unstaged photograph going up the stairs covered with ash and dirt and filth in the desecrated building was this, a remnant of our manuscript project. So this is the page that is photographed with every manuscript to tell you what its uh, shelf mark, what its manuscript number is, and ideally a little bit about what's in it, the measurements, who took the picture, and so on. They were working right up to the moment that ISIS was at the gates, and they had to leave everything behind, including this page. So now we're going to make another turn, and I'm going to tell you about currently our largest project, and this will be the last, last bit of the travelogue. We've been working since 2013 in the Western African country of Mali, and in the Middle Ages... Mali had its own empire and was a very important trading center and center of learning and culture. So you see the gold deposits down here, and you see the caravan routes, which were moving gold, slaves, textiles, and salt between the south and the north. And along with wealth, prosperity, and trading were scholars. And so this region was famous for having um, schools of Islamic learning, which even after the empire of Mali uh, no longer had its golden age, persisted. In 2013, actually 2012, uh, the city of Timbuktu up in northern Mali, the, the fabled remote desert city, was occupied by uh, a group of sort of ethnic and religious uh, extremists. And there were early rumors that they had destroyed all the libraries of Timbuktu. And this photograph was taken shortly after the city was liberated by French paratroopers as evidence that they had gone through these ancient libraries and burned all the manuscripts. It turned out that that was not the case, that, in fact, most of the manuscripts of Timbuktu had been safely removed in advance of the arrival of the extremists. Thanks to the work of this man, Abdul Qadir Haidara, and an organization he founded, they had packed up all the manuscripts of Timbuktu and put them in metal boxes like this and evacuated them um, down the river toward the capital, I guess actually upriver, of Bamako in Mali, uh, where I found them when I made my first visits in 2013, in August and December. 1,400 metal boxes containing the entire intellectual culture of that great medieval center of Islamic 
learning. So we've worked with them since then to open the boxes, digitize the manuscripts, and we now have catalogers at work describing what's in them. So why is this important? This is a uniquely African tradition of Islam, which preserves a lot of traditional religion and shows how religions, whether it be Christian, Christianity or Islam or Judaism or Buddhism or Hinduism, it gets rooted in a particular place and it acquires a distinctive character. And this is an example of a great Islamic culture which has been sorely neglected in Western scholarship because they didn't have access to the sources. Now, when you work in these places, it's not easy. So the manuscripts in Bamako, they're easy. You fly in there on Air France, you do your work. But if you want to go elsewhere in Mali, like to Timbuktu, where manuscripts remain, they weren't all evacuated, some were simply hidden by the families, you have to go under military protection. So you fly up there on a UN plane, either military or humanitarian. You have to stay in the United Nations military camp. And here you see the entrance to what they call the super camp, reminding us that nothing says welcome like razor wire. But we learned the hard way that you have to do this because my first trip to Timbuktu, we didn't stay in the camp. The city was thought to be calm. And in fact, we got caught up in a firefight. So we learned our lesson then and have stayed with them since. And you get a comfortable little dwelling like this uh, with your own protection from mortars and other sorts of uh, artillery and explosives and so on. And we go out from here to actually do our work. When we go into town, we have to have escorts like this. So a little armored vehicle, um, soldiers accompanying us, because Westerners are targets for kidnapping. So again, it's not that they want to kill us because we're, we're not Muslims, although they don't know if we're Muslims or not. They're, we may well be Western Muslims. They want us for kidnapping, because that finances the, the enterprise of, of terrorism. And with that protection, we work with the families of Timbuktu. This is the great mosque of uh, Timbuktu, the Jingarber Mosque. This is the archivist, who's the youngest son of the imam, and their manuscripts, which we've now completely digitized. And so here's a sample of one of our digitizing studios in Timbuktu at another family library, at the Sankore Mosque, the second mosque of Timbuktu. And there's a simple but high quality 35 millimeter format digital camera, a camera stand that we modified and shipped from Minnesota, little tools to hold things that we send with the studio, and the laptop from which everything is done. And here's our team. Now all these people you see in the photograph, these young citizens of Timbuktu, men and women, would not have had employment without our project. And sadly our project is done, so they no longer have the job digitizing and measuring and so on. But at least for that time, they had something. Now, just one last comment about work in Mali. We continue to expand beyond Timbuktu and its tradition. The town of Jene is famous for its mud brick mosque, which you see here, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I'm the son of a builder, so I find buildings really fascinating and I like the way they're built. This one, the scaffolding is on the outside because every year they climb up on those beams and replaster the outside of the mosque with fresh mud as part of a kind of local celebration in honor of their heritage and the extraordinary architecture of this mosque. We're now going around the villages surrounding Jene, uh, thanks to Babu Toure, who's in the front of the photograph in blue, talking to families of scribes and imams about their collections and inviting them to allow us to digitize them. On the floor in front of us, and I'm take the one taking the picture, looking at the, the, the scene here, are manuscripts written by three generations of family scribes. The grandfather, the father, and then the fellow sitting there actually writing in, in a sort of sandy color. And we're gonna make sure that that stuff is safely photographed and then made accessible for research. And our last adventure in August, I was in Mali, in Gao, which is one of the most dangerous places in Mali, but again, we had our security, working with the Kunta family, a very important local, uh, local family with a long tradition of learning. And you can tell that these are people who are very traditional in their dress, and yet open, learned, and eager to work with us. So what happens to all those pictures that we take in exotic locations like that? 
Well, they come home here. So this is, uh, this is my monastery and university in Minnesota. And the place where Gretchen and I met is right there. That's the Collegeville Institute for Ecumenical and Cultural Research, where you get your own little mid-20th mid century modernist Bauhaus type bungalow and write books and have beautiful thoughts. And as you can tell, it's a lovely campus, 2,700 acres, a classic Minnesota landscape of, of lakes and trees. Uh, monks have an eye for property. Uh, we, we need trees and water, because if you're going to start a monastery in the 19th century, those are the two essentials. Because if you have water, well, you need water to grow things. You need water so that you can have a mill, so you dam up a stream, which is the lake at the bottom is actually a dammed up stream. And if you have wood, you can build stuff. And so the Bavarian monks came here in the 1850s and started the monastery. So it's an idyllic situation, at least in the summer, because that's the winter view. Uh, and Gretchen was there during the polar vortex of um, 2019, uh, which I enjoyed from the distance in India. So at the, at the university is Himmel, as we call it, the Himmel Museum and Manuscript Library. Um, we're in right next to the university library and connected to it. This is the reading room where we welcome classes and visiting scholars and the studies you see to the left. Incredibly comfortable chairs, uh, which I highly recommend. Um, the reading room is very popular with students. It's open whenever the main library is open. And it is there that our staff, both local and remote because we have catalogers working for us from Egypt, uh, European countries across the United States, do the work of describing manuscripts so we can put them online. So we do have the online platform for access. Here you see the um, what we call VHIML, virtual HIML, the reading room. And through the reading room, which is the, that sort of panel there, you can click that and get into it and you find information about manuscripts, such as what is the current status of that manuscript? Is it still there? Has it been destroyed? Has it been relocated? I mentioned this aspect of our database earlier. And then you can actually read it. So here's an example of a manuscript photographed in Mosul in Iraq, a pre-ISIS. It's a Syriac manuscript of the 13th century, as you can see. It's a liturgical book used in the celebration of their liturgy. And you can click on the images, and you can zoom them, and you can rotate them, and you can you know, make it bitonal, and you can make it purple. You can do all sorts of cool stuff with it to read it. Now, you'll see on the right, Mosul, and then down a couple, current status, it says unknown. In fact, we learned since the manuscript was destroyed. As part of that conquest of Mo Mosul in June of 2014, and they simply didn't have time to grab it and run. So I, I want to sum up with some numbers, uh, just to give you some idea of the magnitude of what we're doing. It's obviously interesting. You may think it important. But it also is significant in scale. So when we think about Christian manuscripts in the Middle East, and you look at places where we've worked, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Turkey, et cetera, that's the number of libraries that have been digitized and the number of manuscripts in, in, in each of those countries. Now, you look at 21,000, you think 21,000, the library here has what, 500,000 books or whatever it is? 21,000 is nothing. Okay, people, these are manuscripts, right? They're, they're not printed books. And when you compare them to what other libraries have, you realize the potential of this collection for research. So I love this slide. So Western libraries means the British Library, the Vatican, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin, uh, North American libraries, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, whatever. People have money and can buy stuff like that. Add up all their manuscripts, Eastern Christian manuscripts, Syriac, Ethiopic, Armenian, Christian, Arabic. They've got 9,000. We photographed more than 36,000. So this is going to completely change scholarship. And it's also going to have the effect of reuniting intellectual culture. Because most of our study of Eastern Christianity from a Western perspective is based on the manuscripts in London, Paris, Rome, Berlin. And by digitizing the ones that stayed behind, we can complement those collections 
to get something more like a 360 degree view of that particular culture. We mentioned earlier that we turn to Islamic manuscripts, and this is now really our area of major growth, having done most of the Eastern Christian libraries in the Middle East. We started in Ethiopia and Harar, the center of Ethiopian Islam, then families in the old city of Jerusalem, India, Pakistan, where India, where Christians, where Muslims feel persecuted, Pakistan, which has things taken out of India at the time of the partition of India in 1947, and then the work in Mali, Timbuktu, and Jenik. This is a lot of stuff, and particularly the things from Mali now are going to end up being over 200,000. So we catalog them and we put them online. We still have our 93,000 microfilms, and I met somebody this evening who's used some of our microfilms. Of the 200,000 plus digitized manuscripts we have in hand already, and then others coming, we have in our online reading room uh, almost 93,000 manuscript descriptions. And of those, 50,000 are complete digital images of manuscripts. The rest of them are mi microfilms that we haven't scanned yet. We already have more than 14 million images available in the reading room. And many of those images are two-page spreads. So that is a boatload of manuscripts that we're putting out there for people to study. And I know that it's only the very beginnings of this that will happen in my lifetime. But the goal, thinking as Benedictines, thinking in centuries, is that there will be time for people to read and understand and benefit from the voices of the ancestors. And then lastly, here are the uh, URLs, which you really can't see, sorry. It's uh, hemel.org, vhemel.org. It's easy enough to find. And there you can find uh, information about, about us, you know, our history, places we work, uh, who works at Hemel, that kind of thing. And then vhemel.org is where you can actually get in to the manuscripts. And with that, I thank you. Thank you so much, Father Columba. What a great model for us of uh, interesting and meaning-filled life. And uh, this is one of the main reasons why we're giving you this honorary degree. It's so important. We have a few minutes uh, for some questions now. And Dr. Olson has a uh, mic and is willing to run over and uh, uh, bring it to you. Thank you. That was wonderful and inspiring. Um, Every academic hates to get rid of books, and the worst among us are the librarians. And everywhere there is an ancient library, there's everything there. So when you go into a place, into a collection, in an ancient scriptorium or something like that, there will be lots of, putting quotes around it, identifiably religious texts but there will be a whole lot of other stuff, too. How do you triage? Do you decide not to copy some things, or do you just copy it all and then do, do the sorting later? It's the latter. We don't. Is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. It's the latter. We don't do triage. We do everything. Um, now, part of it is that we think that non-religious intellectual culture is important. It is the case that most of the places that we work because they are traditional societies. Most of the manuscripts are religious, but that's, that would be true of the West as well in the pre-modern era. But we're also interested in literature, history, um, dictionaries, mathematics, astronomy slash astrology, because it was for more or less the same thing in that era. And we get it all. So we, we don't try to presume now to determine what people 200 years from now will find interesting for their research. Because you know, scholarship changes their fashions, and people think they have it all figured out. But if you ever wonder, why do they keep writing American history books? Like, can't they just write the history book, and then that's enough? It's because we see different things in each generation. And so that's why it's important to capture all of it. Thank you. I found this uh, 
fascinating. Uh, two, two questions. One on metadata that uh, you have with all the digital material and it's put up and you seem to have accomplished that by saying that checklist of what is, uh, um, you know, found or not found and, you know, unknown or destroyed manuscripts. So the metadata has to keep changing and developing all the time. Uh, that seems to be, you know, a very important thing. But when the migration of, of materials in, that, in the, the way that was done was, was taken place, how do you handle the migration? Because you do have microfilm, and now, you know, the digital material uh, in that regard. And uh, just on a personal aspect, I've, wor I've worked with the Passion to China Collection, which is at the Ricci Institute, uh, mm -hmm. now at Boston College, and also here. Uh, and the, I, I'm intrigued by your personal photos. You're documenting in your personal photos, you know, changing culture of narratives and political narratives that accompany this. How do you hope to use your own personal photos as the dialogue of culture yourself as in a complex or changing societies? Uh, so good question, and it touches not only on my personal photos, but the digital images themselves. How do we keep those available? And how do we do the, the technological migration, the format migration, and so on? So we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Because we promise forever, and to do that requires resources and expertise. So we've, we've started doing something in a recent grant, which we're to the funder, we explained it as future-proofing our data. To say that every terabyte of images that they fund, they will give us $2,000 as an endowment for perpetual care of that data. And we put that into an endowment so that we can ensure that there will always be somebody tending the digital collection because you can't just leave it on a shelf. So advantage of digital, you can put it out there for anybody in the world to see wherever they are. Disadvantage of digital, uh, data does rot if it's not cared for. Now, you mentioned metadata. Uh, so metadata is just information that accompanies the artifact, the digital image. Uh, ideally, at the basic level, where it was taken, when it was taken, maybe the camera that was used. But we add, of course, what you might think of as cataloging. So what's in the manuscript? Who wrote it? Uh, where was it written? What is the actual text? When was it written? And so on. And that's a lot of work by experts, because they have to actually read the darn thing. And then the other problem that we faced is consistency of names, right? Because in the digital era, you have to make sure that people can find what they want. And you have to have a consistent way of naming or redirecting from variant forms of a name to the correct name so that they find the manuscript they need. So we spent a lot of time and effort on that question. And we're currently in a big grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to uh, create an online database, which went live earlier this month, in fact, called the Hemel Authority File, which is nothing but names and titles, as we have determined them to be the best possible way of representing that person or place and all the variants and all of these are going into the Library of Congress name authority file, which is used by librarians uh, around the world. So uh, the picture's the fun part. All the rest of it is the real work. Um, I was just wondering, what is your favorite place that you visited, and what's the most interesting manuscript or artifact that you found? Okay, cheesy answer. Um, the most favorite place I visit is the place I'm in. Um, I'm pretty adaptable, and I get really interested in places. So I, I learn pretty quickly basic customs. I usually know some history. Um, I really like landscapes, so I'm intrigued always by what the terrain is like. Uh, I think if I were forced against the wall to say my favorite place, I'd say Syria, because Syria has a unique range and variety of culture, uh, prehistoric, uh, you know, through the early Christian period, 
it's also a ravishingly beautiful country in terms of, of the landscape. I kind of like deserts. and I like deserts, prairies, oceans. I'm kind of an open spaces guy as opposed to a mountain valley sort of person. And uh, so that has that. But I really get interested in, in anywhere I go. My, I think one of the, the articles written about our work mentioned something my mother did when I was a kid. Here's a tip. National Geographic, maybe some of your families still get National Geographic, but they put maps in things. And all these families across the United States have these copies of National Geographic, which probably end up in the bathroom to read them in there. And they have all these maps. So what do you do with these maps? Because you're not going to explore the Amazon. So my mother took all the maps from all the National Geographics, and she wallpapered my bedroom when I was a kid with these maps. She was an educator. She was a, particularly a sort of early elementary educator, very skilled. And that does something. It did something to me. Like, I got used to thinking of the world geographically and thinking about all these places, and I've had the good fortune to be able to actually go to some of them as a result of this work. All right, my favorite manuscript. I, I get asked this a lot. Um, so one of the most interesting ones I've worked on, I mentioned earlier today to a group, is the oldest known Ethiopian manuscript which is in a monastery in northern Ethiopia, in Tigray, which has been the site of recent conflict. There's been a, a kind of devastating attack on the Tigrayan people by uh, Ethiopian government forces and Eritrea. Long reason why, complicated story about why that is the case, but there's been a lot of destruction. This particular monastery has these two oldest Ethiopian Bibles, which have been carbon dated to between the 6th and the 8th century, and possibly even older, because carbon dating has a margin of error. And they're beautifully written and illuminated. And I had the privilege with two of my colleagues of digitizing those Bibles in April of 2013. Uh, it was actually over Easter time. So that's an extraordinary place, it's unique and important and valuable manuscript. And then the whole process of working with the monastery, which had its ups and downs, uh, to gain access to it uh, was fascinating. But the point I make to people is that not every manuscript is immediately beautiful. They're not all illuminated. They're not all illustrated. Some of them are just notebooks where people have copied a text that they need. But each one of them is a unique witness to the text, like I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks this evening. And so it has merit. And each one of them is a little window into the intellectual life and the preoccupations of people of a particular culture in a particular time and in a particular place. So this is another reason why we photograph everything. We don't just do the pretty ones uh, because the most unassuming looking sort of shabby, worn manuscript might turn out to be the single most important text in a collection, at least according to the way we would interpret it today. Let's take one more question. In the back there. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Father Colomba, for uh, this uh, interesting uh, piece of information that you came with, you know, to give us today. Uh, I just wanted to mention a few things. Um, one is uh, thank you for um, clarifying to me personally uh, the fact that uh, Abu Ibn Battuta was not just uh, a traveler, but was also a scholar. Um, then secondly, uh, I think it's very important to, um, to think about translations. I'll give an example of like Muslims. They are very concerned about Arabic being translated and the Quran losing its meaning. Now, when dealing with these um, manuscripts, um, what, do you, what do you say about the accuracy of, of the translations that you, you're involved in? Translation is a really big topic. It has a particular flavor in terms of the Quran because of the opposition to translation to preserve the purity of the text. Uh, it has a, a flourishing life in the Christian manuscripts, which where texts tend to hop from language to language. And I'm very interested in the process of what happens to a Greek text when it's translated into Syriac and then into Armenian, and what changes? What choices are made? Uh, how is it received by the community? Uh, and that was the example I used earlier of the Syriac uh, Psalter preface. Um, so that's the kind of field in and of itself. In terms of, of accuracy, um, 
Yeah, as I said, I mean, sometimes it's simply a mistake. Sometimes the translator gets a word wrong. Uh, but nonetheless, there is something of interest in, in that text and in the flavor it acquires in a language. Not every language is apt at describing every emotion, every uh, theoretical concept. And so the manuscripts do take on the coloration of the intellectual culture uh, which produced them. And in the Mali material, which is an Islamic culture in West Africa, there are quite a few glosses or little notes in the margin in uh, local languages. So you find things in Sangai and Bambara and Tamashek and so on. And that's really interesting because although they would not officially translate the Quran into that language, you know that when they're teaching it, they have to. And in fact, the Syriac Bible, Syriac Christian Bible, uh, has at least part of its origin is thought to be in Jewish Aramaic paraphrases of the Hebrew Bible done to teach the Bible to people who could not read Hebrew because their spoken language was Aramaic. And so this phenomenon is a really rich and, and interesting one. And just mentioning Aramaic, I should note, sometimes people ask, well, what about Jewish manuscripts? Don't you do Hebrew? They're all done. So there's a great project at the National Library of Israel which has actually photographed every known Hebrew manuscript in the world. So we can check that off our list. Uh, and when you think about the Christian and Islamic material and now add Hindu, we're going to be busy for a while. So thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to invite Father Patrick Rogers forward to offer our benediction. Uh, Patrick, uh, Father Rogers is the executive director of the Jesuit Center. Father Rogers. Let us bow our heads and ask for God's blessing. God of wonder and light, you are the giver of all good gifts, and indeed, all things given to us in this world are expressions of your love and potential vehicles of your grace. We thank you for the gift of our friend, colleague, and now alumnus, Columbus Stewart. Continue to bless his great scholarship done for the good of the church and for the world. We humbly ask you to continue to bless us here at the University of Scranton, where our mission of educating the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, comes to fruition through your gracious and merciful spirit. God bless Catholic and Jesuit education. May God continue to bless the University of Scranton. Amen. Thank you, Father Rogers. Please join me in thanking, congratulating, and welcoming Father Columba to the University of Scranton family. And thank you all for coming to me.